Okay, so again, apologies to everyone for um, earlier. Uh, we're going to uh, start off again now. Uh, I'm going to hand over to Caroline again. I won't go through the introduction again, Caroline. We'll just kick off and, and, and go straight over to you. So if you wouldn't mind starting from the very beginning, and we, uh, again, will start getting recorded to everybody who had originally wanted to join at 12. But it's, I'm delighted to see that a lot of people have stuck around till 1 o'clock. So thank you all so much for your patience. So over to you, Caroline. Thanks, Sandra, and apologies again for the sound. Um, that was my error. We had tested during the day, but I decided to use my laptop in the last minute, so introduce a few IT problems. Um, so just to begin, I am a PhD student, and I'm based in University College Cork, and my PhD is looking at the implementation of risk-based monitoring in academic clinical trials here in Ireland. So um, my presentation today will look at risk-based monitoring and the new ICHCCP guideline. And today, within the presentation, I'll be discussing some findings from my PhD so far. So, um, so just the content. So I'll quickly go through um, the original ICHGCP guideline that was released in 1996. Then I'll discuss the new um, addendum, ICHGCP2. And then we'll get into risk-based monitoring. I will go through a number of risk-based monitoring tools that have been developed to guide monitoring in the future of clinical trials. So again, if there's any um, sound problems throughout the presentation, just give a quick uh, message at the side and we can look at that again. So, so I scheduled this for 45 minutes, so this would include the presentation and questions. So we'll work ahead. So just to get right into it, so anyone who's worked in clinical trials will be familiar with the ICH um, GCP guidelines. So they were um, published in 1996. And basically, they're an international code book for clinical trial conduct. So they set out exactly what should be done when conducting a clinical trial. And the main purpose, really, of these guidelines was to achieve greater harmonization worldwide to ensure that safe, effective, and high-quality medicines were developed and registered in a very resource-efficient manner. So really, they're just a global standard of how we should conduct our clinical trials. And I guess the need for the development of this clinical trial guidelines is closely related to the thalidomide um, I suppose crisis or controversy that came about in the 1960s. So for those who aren't aware, um, thalidomide was given to pregnant women um, as a relief for morning sickness. But the result, side effects of thalidomide were never tested on pregnant women, and unfortunately, taking thalidomide during pregnancy led to a lot of birth defects in babies that were born then as a result. So this controversy around thalidomide, and I suppose the idea that a drug was given to a pregnant woman without properly testing, really led to the need for a global clinical trial guideline that we all conduct our clinical trials under the same strict regimen. And quickly, this is just, as you can see, a map of the world, and um, I've laid out the places that follow ICHGCP. So you can see Ireland is marked here um, with the red arrows. So I suppose anyone working in Ireland will be very familiar with the ICH GCP guidelines, and we are committed to conduct their clinical trials within good clinical practice. And I guess just to kind of give a real life example of what does ICH GCP mean in practice. So if a trial is conducted within ICH GCP, that means the results should be accurate and reliable. So for example, if a trial is conducted in Canada, the results should then be applicable to Ireland because the trial is conducted within ICH-GCP. So a good example of this is um, the new drug, Nalmicin, apologies for my pr pronunciation, but it's a drug that is um, for patients who are alcohol dependent and it looks to reduce the alcohol consumption within this patient group. So this drug was trialed um, between 2000 and 2013, so over a five year period, this drug was tr trialed in um, these 10 European countries I've listed below. And um, as you can see, Ireland isn't included in these European countries. And as a result, so they trialed the drug, they found that it was effective, that it did actually reduce alcohol consumption within this population. And as the trial was conducted within ICH GCP standards, the results were accurate and that allowed the HPRA, so in Ireland this is our Health Products Regulatory Authority, to um, basically license the drug in Ireland. So it just shows even though the drug wasn't trialed in Ireland, it was trialed in European countries under ICH GCP, and then as a result we can now license the drug in Ireland. 
So that's just kind of a practical example of how ICH GCP works. So there's 30 principles of ICH GCP, and um, I'm not going to go through them, um, and I don't expect anyone to be able to read this text here, but just to give you an outline of our 13 principles. But for today, we're just going to focus on monitoring. So what does GCP say about monitoring? So within um, the guidelines, it states that the purpose of monitoring a child, there's three purposes really. Number one is to ensure the rights and well-being of the subject participants are protected. Number two, to ensure that the trial data is accurate, complete, and that is verifiable from the source document, as well as that the study is conducted in compliance with the, the PRU protocol, with GCP, and in Ireland that we comply with the HPRA, because the HPRA govern really clinical trials in Ireland. So we're just going to focus on the monitoring aspect of um, GCP today. And I know the example of thalidomide I gave is that was back in the 1960s. And obviously a lot has changed and a lot has improved in terms of clinical trial conduct. But I, don't, I think we still need to be very aware we can't become complacent at how risky and how serious clinical trials can be. And um, I suppose a very recent example of I suppose, when clinical trials go wrong is this study that was conducted in France in January of this year. So the study was a phase one trial and it was looking at um, a new painkiller that was cannabis based. So your normal phase one study, but unfortunately um, it went wrong and patients were injured as a result. So as you can see here, just I want to highlight some areas and how monitoring can really, um, I suppose, affect the safety of a clinical trial. So on day one of this study in France, um, a patient was admitted to hospital with an SAE. So they took the recommended 50 megagrams of the study drug. And then on day two, they continued to run this trial and they gave patients the same dose of drug. And they did not inform the participants that on day one, someone had been admitted to hospital as a result of the trial. So if you're familiar with um, patient consent, this is obviously a big no-no. A patient needs to know exactly the risk that they're going to incur as a result of the trial. So the patients on day two should have been informed of the SAE that had happened on day one. And as well, the dose of the drug that was given on day two should have been looked at. Was it okay to give the same dose that had caused an SAE on day one? And as well, obviously, there was a lot of delays in how this SAE was reported. So I think this really recent example, which is just back in January, shows why we need to continuously monitor clinical trials and why we can't become complacent in how we conduct our research. So that was a very quick whistle stop of ICH, um, the first, the original, which was released in 1996. And now we're just going to get into ICH GCP um, version 2. So it's set to be released in November, so in eight weeks' time. So I suppose, as you can imagine, the original ICH GCP was released in 1996, and of course a lot has changed in the last, last 20 years. I suppose in terms of clinical trial conduct, one of the main changes really is the, I suppose, how IT dependent we are now. So back in 1996, electronic case report forms might not have been as much used as, as they are now in clinical trials in 2016. So for the rest of um, the presentation, I'm going to be really looking at the draft document of ICH GCP version 2. So as I just stated, um, the, new, the final version of this document won't be available until November. So for that reason, I'm just going to work with the draft document that was released in um, June 2015. And from this document, I'm going to give you guidelines on how they want us to change how we're monitoring our clinical trials. So for those who haven't read the document, the, the draft document, and apologies, the quality of this image isn't very good, but I just wanted to show you how, um, how it looks really and how the addendums are marked. So you can see here, I just, this is the first page of the draft document. So above is the original text from ICH GCP1, and then below is clearly, um, I suppose, posted the addendum. So basically the new information that's been added to GCP or any changes. And as you go throughout the draft document, it clearly shows where an addendum has been made and where new information or new guidelines have been introduced. So the draft document is really easy to follow, and I'm, I'm guessing or assuming the final version of ICH GCP will follow the same um, format, really. So it's a very easy document to follow, and it's clearly signposted where we need to change our, how we conduct trials. 
Um, again, so in terms of um, milestones, ICH GCP is set to be released in November 2016. I suppose just to be aware, there will be almost a grace period of six months after November before you need to implement the changes of ICH GCP2. So the document will come out in November, and then you'll have six months, I suppose, to get familiar with the new content, and then within six months you should start implementing the new guidelines in ICH GCP2. So I guess why do we need a revised um, GCP? And this is just text directly from the draft document. So it states here the aim of the new version is to encourage implementation of improved and more efficient approaches to clinical trial conduct. So in a nutshell, basically they want to improve how clinical trials are being conducted on a global basis. So that's kind of the main aim of the new um, version. And then I suppose to break this down into reasons, there are three reasons listed as to why we need the new version. And I'm just going to go through them now. So the first one is cost. So again, as I stated before, a lot has changed since 1996. So the cost and I suppose even the complexity of the clinical trials that we are running, they're a lot more advanced since what was conducted in 1996 and even the types of studies that are being conducted. There's a lot more trials now in chronic conditions, and these studies require a longer follow-up time. So that obviously leads them to the expense. If a study is run for longer to look for possible side effects, this would involve a study team, IT systems, so obviously the cost is a lot more than originally in 1996. So this is one reason. Uh, and then the second reason goes back very much again to technology, the improvements in technology, this whole idea of risk management. That wasn't, I suppose, maybe, I don't know if it was understood in 1996, but it wasn't really linked into the original ICH GCP. So I'm doing, going to park this reason here because I'll discuss that more um, when we get on to risk based monitoring. And then the third reason for the change relates back to how we, how we store um, our clinical trial documents, our electronic records, stage protection concerns, but as well, I suppose, in terms of um, electronic records, some people might be involved in clinical trials where everything is monitored centrally. So maybe a patient consent form is actually uploaded to um, an IT system, and then the monitor, this, the monitor can actually look at this consent form from a remote location. So these kinds of um, processes weren't available in 1996. So the new ICH TCP just really is looking at the changes in clinical trial conduct and trying to come up with a better way and a more appropriate way for us now to conduct clinical trials in 2016. That's just so the three reasons listed there as to why we need this new version of ICH GCP. And um, so I just went quickly went through the draft document myself because I wanted to see what sections the addendums were linked to. So I went through the document and I just found um, each addendum. So for today, I'm only going to focus on um, the sponsor section. So in total, there was 18 addendums that I counted. But I suppose just to be aware, um, it was just the count. There was no scientific rigor involved in this. And as well, the new guidelines, they might, there might be more um, addendums in the final version. But this is what I counted from quickly going through the draft document. But for today, we're just going to look at um, the changes to the sponsor's role. Because within the sponsor's role, this is where clinical trial monitoring comes in, into the ICH GCP guidelines. So apologies for the colour there, but um, so in the original ICH GCP 1996, it stated that a sponsor should ensure that the trial is adequately monitored, and the sponsor should determine the appropriate extent and nature of monitoring. So this. Was this in a way it was quite vague. It gave a lot of responsibility to the sponsor to determine how a trial should be monitored. And in response to um, this need for monitoring, emerged the process of how we traditionally monitor our studies. So traditionally, it's a very much intensive on-site monitoring. So somebody would actually go to the study site, go through paper records, and do a lot of source data verification as well traditionally a very low reliance on centralized monitoring. And again, this links back into the improvements of IT that maybe weren't available back in 1996. And with traditional monitoring, um, many of you might be aware, in recent years, it's kind of come under fire in terms of flaws associated with traditional monitoring. So many would argue that um, on-site monitoring is just not cost-effective. 
So it's not cost effective to send someone out to a clinical trial site to go through hundreds or thousands of source data um, verification. And again, in terms of efficiency, source data verification, in terms of generating good data quality, this has been questioned in the past number of years. So I guess all these flaws are related to the traditional monitoring has led to this emergence of this new type of monitoring in ICH GCP version two. So I suppose just to give a practical um, look at what I mean by traditional monitoring. So here I've listed two studies that are being conducted here in UCC in University College Cork. And um, just, I'm not going to go through the studies, but as you can see, I've put a mark around the study population. So in the Strider study, um, it's looking, so your, your population is pregnant women. And in the trust study, you have healthy older adults. So obviously the risks associated with these two populations are very different. So you could argue that does trust require the same amount of monitoring as Strider when the risk, pr risk profiles are so different? So in the original um, ICHGCP, it very much led it up to the sponsor to determine how they should monitor their clinical trials. But in the new addendum, so in version two, it's a bit more specific. It gives you examples of what they want a, a monitor to do. So here, um, just to link this. So in line, so for the new ICHGCP, it states that the sponsor should develop a systematic prioritized risk-based approach to clinical trial monitoring. So it's this idea of the risk-based approach. This has led to the term risk-based monitoring. Because I know um, even from doing my PhD, there's been a lot of confusion around the term risk-based monitoring. Some people have kind of mixed this up with centralized monitoring, but it's, not, it's very much separate. Risk-based monitoring is an approach to how you monitor the complete clinical trials. And also within um, the new ICHGCP, it also states that you should do so you should use a risk-based approach that incorporates on-site and centralized monitoring. But the type of on-site and centralized monitoring needs to be directly proportional to the risk of the trial. So going back again to the trust trial, you need to look at the risks, and then this has to determine how you monitor your study. Apologies for all the animations. Um, so just a quick, um, I suppose, term check for people who aren't familiar with these terms. So again, because I'll use them, I suppose, now for the rest of the presentation. So on-site monitoring is when someone comes in person to a clinical trial site. That might be a hospital setting or maybe a GP setting. And when they go through patient records to look for any, I suppose, make sure everything's being conducted correctly. And also when they're at the site, they might look at the pharmacy, how drugs are being stored, and just other procedures. So they would actually physically go on site and do an on-site visit. And then I suppose the other side of monitoring is centralized monitoring. And this occurs when electronic data is just fed into an IT system and someone, so for example, the trial has been run in Ireland, but we feed all our data into a database and then someone in Canada can go through our electronic records and look for outliers, look for anything suspicious that might say there's something risky going on in the trial, and it requires more monitoring. So that's just the two different types of monitoring, on-site monitoring or centralized monitoring. And I just want to flag this as well, because I know the talk is just on um, the new GCP guideline, but as well, just to be aware, um, the new EU clinical trial regulation, which is coming out in 2016, I think also, they are also allowing reduced monitoring for low intervention trials. So in a way, they're also kind of taking on this risk-based approach to how we monitor clinical trials. And below, I've listed what the EU regards as a low intervention trial. So I suppose the main thing really is that you're using a study drug that is authorized, and you're using the study drug for the purpose it was authorized. So this is just to flag as well that this whole idea of risk-based monitoring is also being endorsed and promoted in the new um, EU clinical trial regulation. I, suppose, I guess the million dollar question is, how do we actually do risk-based monitoring? So obviously the EU are promoting this, ICGH, GCP want us to do it, but how exactly do you develop a risk-based monitoring plan? I think this is a question that I came up against um, throughout my PhD. So there's a lot of guidance out there, and 
I suppose anyone who's been following the risk-based monitoring debate will be familiar with these two reports that were developed, that were, sorry, published by the EMA and the FDA, I think back around 2012. And obviously these reports really set the kind of the ground running for um, risk-based monitoring. And they're very good reports and they do encourage risk-based monitoring, but they don't really go into kind of the nitty gritty of how do you actually develop a risk-based monitoring plan and then how do you implement risk-based monitoring. So that was one of the big issues that I came up against in the PhD. So again, we should do it, but the instructions just aren't clear. And when we look at back what, what the GCP version 2 says, so again, it says you should develop a risk-based monitoring plan, and you should do on-site and centralized monitoring, but just how do you actually develop this risk-based monitoring plan? And these were questions that um, myself and my supervisors kind of came up against at the very start of the PhD. And I guess as my PhD is look, looking at risk-based monitoring, we had to come up with some solution to this question. And um, so what we did was ju we just did a systematic review looking at risk-based monitoring tools for clinical trial monitoring. So we really wanted practical advice on how you should actually develop your risk-based monitoring plan. So as well, um, this paper is soon to be published in the Journal of Contemporary Clinical Trials, so if anyone's interested in reading that. And um, so a very quick background on the systematic review. So a number of risk-based monitoring tools have been developed to guide risk-based monitoring. And I'll go into risk-based monitoring tools more in a moment, but I suppose despite the fact that they are there, these tools are available, it's still a gold standard approach does not exist. So if I just pause for a second, um, so people who are still logged in might be wondering, what am I on about, but what in particular is a risk-based monitoring tool? So just to explain what I mean by that, um, a risk-based monitoring tool, it can be a paper-based questionnaire or an IT system. So it's really anything that allows you to develop or supports you in developing a risk-based monitoring plan. But in particular, it needs to follow these two functions set out by the OECD. So in 2012, the OECD released a really nice paper which looks at clinical trial governance and clinical trial monitoring. And I have the reference at the end of the slide. And within that document, they state that a risk-based monitoring tool should have two functions. So number one, it should be able to assess the risk within a clinical trial protocol. And then number two, it should form guidance on how these risks should be monitored. So obviously, first of all, you need to be able to identify risks in the study, and then you need to determine how you can actually work with these risks, how you can mitigate that risk. So I'm going to go back to trust, because I know um, when I talk about this, I kind of cause confusion. So when I'm looking at risks, it's not just the risk-benefit ratio that you would normally do when you're um, developing a clinical trial that would really just focus on the drug. When you're talking about monitoring, you're looking at the risk of the whole study. So um, this is just the trust study again, and I've just gone through the risks here looking at the trust protocol. So if you go down to number three, the study team. So the trust study team, their experience, so this would obviously reduce the risk if, for example, an inexperienced study team are running the trial. Again, you're looking at stuff like data collection. So how are you collecting your data for that study? Are you using paper-based records? Or in trust, we used um, an ECRS. But again, there's obviously risk associated with ECRS. So as we've seen um, earlier today, IT is great when it works, but um, sometimes it doesn't work, um, as we've seen this morning. So what you need with ECRS, if there's glitches in the IT system, what impact would this have on the study? So if there's a glitch in the IT system and allows you to enroll an ineligible patient, this is obviously extremely risky. So you need to consider all of these risks when you're developing your monitoring plan. And again, stuff like location, a hospital setting would obviously be a lot better than going out to a community setting. So these are just, when I'm talking about risks for monitoring, these are the risks I'm referring to. So just again, I want to give an example of um, a risk-based monitoring tool. So um, the MHRA, so they're based in the UK, and they're the equivalent to our HPRA here in Ireland. They're a regulatory um, authority and they govern how clinical trials are conducted in the UK. And back in 2012, um, they published their own risk-based monitoring tool, which is basically a paper document. And um, here, it gives guidance on how they score 
the risk of a clinical trial. So I've just looked at the type A study. So in accordance with the MHRA, they would say that a type A study, is, which is a low risk study, is a study again that is using a drug that is licensed within the EU. So, once, so stage one again is first you need to assess the risk of your study, and then stage two, you need to determine how to monitor these risks. So again, within the MHRA document, it states that, so you're working with a low risk trial, you can monitor everything centrally, but if you notice anything centrally that might require on-site monitoring. So it will recommend a low risk study requires centralized monitoring unless something is identified from this monitoring that would require someone to go on site. So this is an example of a really simple paper-based risk-based monitoring tool and allows you to assess the risk in a trial and then it gives you appropriate guidance on how to monitor these risks. So um, that's just a lot of background there. So back to um, the systematic review. So in terms of methods, um, I won't go through them in too much detail, but we looked at published and great literature. And our main inclusion criteria were that the risk-based monitoring tools, that they met the two functions set out by the OECD. So this is really important. And to get into results, um, so we had our published literature, which came from PubMed and Embase. PubMed, excuse me, and Embase. And then we had our grey literature, which is basically a Google search where we put in our search terms. But I just want to, um, I suppose, direct you to the third source of data, which came from um, experts within clinical trial monitoring. So this is really important. A lot of the risk-based monitoring tools, there's kind of a commercial element to it, and a lot of the IT companies at the moment are developing their own software to guide this risk-based monitoring. So from the grey literature, it still wasn't possible for us to identify these companies. So instead, we went to experts um, in the area and asked them to give us a list of all the companies that might be potentially developing risk-based monitoring tools, IT tools. And um, so from the first search, we found 443 potentials. But um, as everyone knows from doing a systematic review, after the first review of titles and abstracts, we got rid of 419 of these papers. And I guess the main reason why they were excluded was for published literature, a lot of this document is very much guidance. It's back to the FD and the EMA reports. They inform us that we should do risk-based monitoring, but they don't tell us how we should do it. And as well for the commercial companies, so we had identified 46 suitable companies, but in the end, we had to exclude 30. So the reason for this, um, some companies didn't want to get involved in systematic review, um, so we alerted them via email that we were doing the systematic review. And if the companies didn't respond, then they were excluded. And also a number of companies, their actual IT software wasn't ready for release, so they couldn't, at this stage, get involved in the systematic review. So after all, um, I suppose, the data filtering, we were then left with 24 risk-based monitoring tools that we've looked at in the systematic review. And eight of them are paper-based tools, like the MHRA tool um, I discussed a moment ago. And then 16 of them were IT tools that operated as a service as a system. So this service as a system, um, for people who aren't IT savvy, a really good example of this would be the antivirus that you have on your desktop. So basically, you go to that company, you buy their antivirus package for a year maybe, and within that year, it does kind of a sweep of your desktop to look for any glitches, any kind of security concerns. So the risk-based monitoring tools operate in the same way as an antivirus system would operate. And just to give a really quick view, um, this is one of those IT tools. So the company is called Syntegrity. So, and I'll actually discuss this more in a moment for the results. So in terms of um, data extraction, so what we wanted to get from the results, we wanted to see, first of all, did the tools function as the OECD said they should? So do they assess risk and do they give guidance on how you can control these risks? And then secondly, we looked at how do these tools, um, I suppose, what mitigation recommendations do they give for risk? So do they offer advice on centralized monitoring and on-site monitoring? And as well, and I haven't touched on this yet, um, which is very important here, it's the bottom point in that blue bubble. Um, Risk-based monitoring is very much a systematic process. So when you are conducting, when you are developing your, your monitoring plan, a risk-based monitoring plan at the start, 
you might determine this study is low risk. But throughout the duration of the trials, things might occur that actually move that risk from low risk up to medium risk. So for example, maybe study drugs aren't being stored properly, the study team might not be properly trained, they're enrolling in eligible patients, uh, consent isn't being taken properly. So the study may have started off as a low risk study, but has escalated now to a medium risk study. So with risk-based monitoring, it's really a continuous process. You need to constantly look at the risk profile of your trial to determine the best action against these risks. So, sorry now. Just to go through the results, so this is table one. We just looked at the characteristics of the risk-based monitoring tool, and I'm just going to give the MHRA um, just as an example. So we looked at where they were developed, what language were they administered in, was there a cost, did they, were they free to buy or did you have to pay for the tool? And then we looked at, again, um, what kind of strategy did, um, monitoring strategy did the tool inform? So again, look at stuff at what risk do they look at? So here the MHRA tool looked at the risks associated with the study drug, data protection risks. So that's what we looked at in terms of the results. And again, we looked, as I said before, do they offer a process for systematic review of the risk profile? And again, quickly to go back to its integrity, so this is one of the IT systems. So we did the same here. And one of the main differences in terms of the paper base, well, not, well there's many differences, but obviously costs. So the, there's a cost associated with the IT systems that isn't there with the paper base too, because they're often free to download from websites. And then again, so what strategy was offered by the IT tool? So um, this, integri this integrity software used a risk assessment tool that was developed by Transcelerate. So they're an American, um, I think they're a biopharmacal company, and they, they are really leading the way in risk-based monitoring. And I'll discuss that um, Transcelerate tool in a moment. And then again, they provided um, support for on-site monitoring. So this was really important because these IT systems, they're perfect for centralized monitoring because that's what they do. They take in a lot of data, like electronic data, and then they do kind of a sweep for risk. But it's very important that these systems also allow manual entry of data that's being collected during on-site monitor visits. So again, for example, if a study monitor is going out to a site, noticing a lot of errors, this information needs to be fed into the IT system so there needs to be a link between the centralized and on-site monitoring information in order to get a full idea of the risk profile of a trial. And um, so again, in terms of assess um, systematic assessment of the risk, obviously the IT systems, they offer a very different process. A lot of them would have algorithms that they would run maybe every four weeks, every six weeks, and they would find um, certain kinds of presets criteria of risk that might be within the clinical trial. So obviously this function isn't available in a paper-based tool. And then finally, um, we looked, we mapped um, the, the risk-based monitoring tools onto this new taxonomy. So I just want to highlight, this is actually a really interesting paper, and I have the, the link above. So it's risk indicator taxonomy for, for supervision of clinical trials on medicinal products. So this taxonomy lists out all the possible risks that are associated with clinical trials and monitoring. And just to break them down, it looks at what the study drug is, who is conducting the study, and how the trial is being conducted. So these three tables is how we examine the risk-based monitoring tools that we identified from the systematic review. So really, just to summarize that, all the tools are published between 2005 and 2016. So published or released, obviously, depending on the IT or the paper base. So I think this is quite interesting. It really shows that risk-based monitoring is very much still in its infancy. And I suppose there's no doubt that when the new guidelines are released in November, you'll see a big influx of risk-based monitoring tools, especially into the IT sector. And again, um, as I mentioned previously that Integrity, they use this Transcelerate risk assessment tool. So six of the IT systems actually all use the same kind of risk assessment tool within, built into their IT system. And um, this tool, so Transcelerate, is actually free to download from the site, and it's an Excel sheet. Again, apologies, this is for the poor quality of this image, 
but it's a really good starting point. So if anyone is thinking of doing risk-based monitoring, I would definitely log on to Transcelerate's page, and you can download this Excel sheet for free, and it gives you a full list of different risks within, that could be within a clinical trial. It gives you examples of how you should grade these risks and then how you should mitigate the risks. So a lot of the IT um, companies are actually using this freely available um, Excel sheet, to, and they're building this into their IT system. So just to summarize again, um, in, within the characteristics of risk-based monitoring tools, we wanted to look at who has actually assessed the quality of the monitoring strategy that this tool recommends. So to explain that further, um, so from the 24 tools we identified, only one of them have actually tested the monitoring strategy that it provides. So this is a link to the study, it's the Optimum study. It's a French trial. And what it did was it prospectively compared the effectiveness of its risk-based monitoring strategy to more traditional monitoring methods. So when I'm talking traditional, you're looking at on-site monitoring with very intensive site, site data verification. So this was a really interesting study because obviously there's a really big push towards risk-based monitoring. But as such, there's no evidence to suggest that it's as good as or better than traditional monitoring methods. And um, I think kind of worryingly, um, this study found that actually the risk-based monitoring was less effective than traditional monitoring at detecting consent process SEE reporting, which is really important, um, reporting study outcomes. So this is the first study that has looked at risk-based monitoring and traditional monitoring together. And it was, unfortunately, it showed that traditional monitoring, well, not unfortunately, but for um, people who want to look at risk-based monitoring, but it found that traditional monitoring was actually more effective as a monitoring tool. So that's just something kind of to keep an eye out of. And I'm sure as the months progress, there'll be more studies like this conducted. So I think just as a take-home message really from the systematic review, I've li listed four criteria that I think um, you should look at when you're looking at your risk-based monitoring tool. So if you are thinking of, well, I suppose when the ICHGCP version two comes out, there will be a move towards this risk-based monitoring. And when you're looking at getting a tool to guide this process, you would want something that allows you to assess the risk in a clinical trial, that allows, gives you guidance on how to mitigate these risks, and then offers some guidance on how to systematically re review the risk of the clinical trial. And again, you want to make sure that it's cost efficient so one of the main criticism of traditional monitoring is that it's very expensive. So if you're looking at risk-based monitoring, I think you would think that it is less expensive. So obviously, if the, the strategy that's offered by these free paper-based tools, if that's as good as the IT systems, which can be often quite costly, you might have to look at your budget and what's the best way to implement risk-based monitoring. And then, um, so, so back to Ireland and back to the PhD that I'm doing. So I'm looking at academic-led studies in Ireland. And so where are we now in terms of risk-based monitoring? So um, that's the picture of Joe Eustace there on the left-hand corner. So he is the director of um, the CRCI, so the Clinical Research Initiative here in Ireland. And the CRCI and as well the team are in um, who are hosting today's webinar. We are looking at examining how risk-based monitoring will be implemented in clinical trials in Ireland. And I suppose the list on the left, um, oh, sorry, the right, within the blue box, shows you all the different um, academic clinical trial units. So here I'm based in University College Cork, so I'm affiliated with the CRS Cork. So it's looking at really how are the academic units, how are we going to take on this new need to do risk-based monitoring. And also I just want to take this opportunity to thank everyone who took part in a survey. So as part of um, my PhD, we wanted to gather um, information on how we are actually monitoring clinical trials in Ireland at the moment. So are people using on-site monitoring? Are they doing centralized monitoring? Is anyone actually doing risk-based monitoring? So this is really important because it will form the baseline and it will show the need, I suppose, in terms of intervention, what we need to do to get risk-based monitoring up and going. And as well, it's very important that we can operate centralized monitoring and on-site monitoring because we need to be able to do both if we really want to have a properly risk-based approach to monitoring. And just some really initial findings from this survey. Um, so I think, as you could guess, risk-based monitoring is not very common. 
And I guess that's to be expected as the new ICH GCC guidelines, they're not going to be released till November. So as such, there probably isn't a huge need at this very present time to do risk-based monitoring. And then I guess the next stage for us is to look at why is risk-based monitoring so low? And to do this, we're going to um, conduct a number of interviews with clinical trial researchers in Ireland. And we want to look at, so why aren't you doing risk-based monitoring? What would encourage you to do risk-based monitoring? Do you have any concerns regarding this new type of monitoring system? So as I showed you previously, the results of the Optimum trial show that traditional monitoring was more effective. So, so if we just want to look at people's opinions, are they happy to implement this new type of risk-based monitoring? Or are there some concerns that might stop them from fully engaging in the new ICHGCP guidelines? And then I think within Ireland, we want to develop interventions really looking at how we can support clinical researchers in developing risk-based monitoring. So nearly finished now, so thanks everyone for sticking in. So back to where we are today. So today we're looking at risk-based monitoring and the new ICH GCP guidelines. And I just want to give everyone my email address. So if there's anything I haven't covered today, or if um, I spoke too fast, which I do sometimes, and you want me to clarify anything, um, please do email me and I can discuss that further with you. So that's my email address at the top. And um, here we there. And I guess the take home message is risk-based monitoring is coming. Um, so the ICH, GCP, the new EU regulation, it is coming and it probably will become the future of clinical trial monitoring. So it's really something just to keep an eye out on. And um, again, I didn't bombard the slide with references. So I think the, the top ones are really are the most, I would feel important references in terms of risk-based monitoring. And I just want to flag again the ICRIN website at the bottom. So for those who aren't familiar, ICRIN, it's a European initiative and they're really also looking at risk-based monitoring. And if you follow this link, you'll be able to get um, access to all the paper-based risk-based monitoring tools that I was discussing, and they're free to download then from the ICRIN website. So if you are going to log on, it would be worth looking at what the Swiss are doing, because so they've already kind of brought this into law in Switzerland, the risk-based monitoring, so it's quite an interesting too. And um, finally, I'm finished, so thank you so much for everyone who stayed in since 12 o'clock, and apologies again for the IT problems, so thank you. That's great, Caroline. Uh, thank you so much. That was that was wow. That was a lot of information, and it was really good. And it was certainly well worth hanging on for. And again, thanks to everyone who did who did uh, wait around and join in again. And as I said, we will be circulating the recording to everyone. Um, I'd like to open up uh, the Q and A session. Uh, so anyone who's online there that has a question for Caroline. If you could use the chat or the Q&A facility on the right-hand side of your screens, and I can redirect the questions to Caroline. Um, <laughs> as well as Caroline mentioned that she is a PhD scholar, so you know, it might be a question, but you might have maybe a comment or a suggestion or um, something to recommend to Caroline, and so sure she'd be very open to hearing from all of you. Uh, one thing, Caroline, I didn't mention to you before you started today, that you've officially taken the title as the highest number of people registering for a webinar, the HRB TMRN. The previous holder of that title was David Moore in Canada. So uh, you've now topped that with 85 people registering for the webinar, which is fantastic. It would fantastic. be typical that we have, of course, we don't have IT problems then, yeah. Well, that's great, that's great. That, that, that's fine. I'm no, I'm, I was delighted. Lots of people stuck around and came back and joined in um, at 1 o'clock. So again, thank you, thank you all for, for, for doing that. I think this is a great um, experience for Caroline and her PhD, and as you can see, she's, uh, she's making great headway and has fantastic results already. Um, I suppose, Caroline, just give people a chance there to think about what they'd like to ask you uh, from question-wise. I was just wondering, do you kind of link in with people on the ground and kind of get a sense of what people prefer with regards to monitoring tools and for risk, with regards to risk-based risk -based monitoring tools? For example, like paper versus IT tools. You mentioned a few different ones there. Do you get a sense from people that they prefer one or the other? Do you think that people who use paper-based would be a little bit um, anxious about going to an IT tool? Or what's your sense from, from people on the ground? So I think, Sandra, really, this whole idea of even risk-based monitoring tools is so new. I'm not sure how familiar people are with the different types of IT or the paper-based. So yes. anyone who I've spoke to about risk-based monitoring, I suppose the main um, comments I would get in, 
I suppose in terms of a bit of I'm not sure exactly what way it will go in terms of will it be as good at traditional monitoring, but when it came back to risk-based monitoring tools, I've actually had very little discussion with people. I don't know if people are aware that these these guys exist out there, because it's such a new area. It's, so, you know, the data haven't had any discussions yet in terms of which is preferred, and that's kind of something that we hope to look at as well within the PhD, to look at what do they really offer, like which is the best way to go. Do you want your IT one? which can be linked into your electronic case report form, or do you just want to do a simple SOP kind of questionnaire paper-based mm -hmm. form? So mm -hmm. no, no discussions yet, Sandra. <laughs> which is great, Luana. You just mentioned that as part of the PhD, you'll be doing interviews, but so then you'll get a, a good sense of yeah. what people's perceptions are of it. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, so if anyone else has a question, feel free to type away. I'll, I'll keep going for a few minutes with, with Caroline. Um, and one thing while, while we do have good to people on the line, Caroline, is there anything at this point that you need from trialists out there that are listening in? I know you mentioned your first survey that you did. Let's say somebody's listening and they go, oh, I didn't complete that survey. Is there any way you want people to communicate back to you on their trial at this point, or will it be something you look for in the future? Well, it would be great um, if people do want to complete the survey. So it's an Irish survey, just to give me an email, and I can send them on the link. So we're still collecting data. I think as well, um, if I haven't really come across anyone who's done risk-based monitoring, so it would be great to discuss that with someone within the academic sector who maybe they've done risk-based monitoring in previous studies, and to, to give me exactly what, I suppose, how do they do it and what do they think of risk-based monitoring. So if anyone's out there with that information, then send an email. Yeah, and we will, I might include that to the communication of all the participants in the webinar as well, just to kind of feed back to us. Um, and then just in relation to the um, update to the guidelines, you were saying that there's six months to make these, implementa these um, implementations. Uh, as if I, I, from my own point of view, I'm not as familiar with that. I'm wondering, are people uh, worried <laughs> about making these implementations over six months? It, would you have any recommendations? I suppose, is there any training available? I, obviously, the TMRN offers training, and we're trying to a topic that people would be interested in. I suppose, what recommendations could you make to people for where do they go to find out what they need to? Because I know your slides were lovely and clear and you kind of had outlined um, the changes that were made. Is there anything online that people should access or actually, and as I say, you know, if there's anyone uh, who's interested in training in any particular area, the get your PTMRN is always welcome to hear your thoughts on it. But I just thought I'd ask that to you, Caroline, if there's anything you came across that kind of helped you. I suppose in relation to the new guidelines, so I would work closely with the clinical research facility here in Cork, and I know mm -hmm. I just spoke yesterday with our quality manager, so she, um, Raymond Keane, so she would do a lot of the ICH GCP training. So I know that they are in the process of um, kind of developing an, up, an updated training, really, when the new ICH GCP guidelines come out. So I'm guessing that any of the other academic units who have quality managers, they're probably going down the same process. Mm. So I'm sure once the guidelines are released, there will probably be internal emails being sent notifying of the new change, and maybe then people might have to update their GCP certificate just with an idea of the new um, updates. But again, as a disclaimer, I'm not a quality manager, and this wouldn't be my area, but I know in UCC, within as we sponsor studies, they would take on this role, and they would, I suppose, inform people of the new changes. So I'm, I'm guessing Brilliant. this is a procedure that would happen in other um, units. Great, great, thanks. And I'm just wondering, and this is more my own uh, limitation here, I'm wondering, you know, you were talking about, okay, risk-based monitoring, you decide the risk of your trial, and then when you've yeah. done that assessment, uh, who do you report that to, you know, when you decide, okay, this is a low-risk trial, I'm going to go this way, is there someone that you have to formally report that to? So I suppose it would be the sponsor of the study who would okay. help you develop the trial, and then, this is, and this is kind of interesting as well, what take will the HPRA have mm -hmm. on these because obviously they are the ones who govern clinical trials in Ireland, so and I haven't seen anything from the HPRA yet. So it would be very interesting to see what do they say in terms of risk-based monitoring and what guidelines do they give in terms of is it a low risk, a high risk, or like a medium risk? Because in the UK, the MHRA have taken kind of they've been really proactive in this and they've released their guidelines, but I haven't seen anything like that in Ireland. So I yes. think, again, it's November, so I'm sure once November hits, there'll be a lot more publications yes. coming in the area. Brilliant. That's great. Um, so what I might do as well, I, we, I don't think we have any questions as yet. I don't see anything popping up. I'm going to see something out. Uh, I'm just going to have a quick look here. 
Um, ah, okay, so I have a, just a comment here. Yes, we also do ICH TCP training in infant and are planning on doing courses once the new guideline is published. Okay. All researchers will have to have their search updated. So, um, okay. That was Jackie O'Leary. Thanks a minute, Jackie, for that. And um, actually, I'd, I'd love to hear about that, Jackie. You can, uh, I might touch base with you afterwards and we can pop this up on the TMRI website as well and, and promote it that way. Um, okay, I just have um, another question here from Siobhan Warren. Mm -hmm. I was wondering if Caroline speaks to sites that are monitored in this way and what her thoughts are being on the, um, sorry, what her thoughts are being on the receiving end of risk-based monitoring. So again, I think, Caroline, you mentioned that you would be talking to people a bit more in the next phase, but I, I'll let you um, comment on that. So, um, so Siobhan, from just the survey that I did as well, I only found five um, clinical trials that have used risk-based monitoring previously, and I haven't um, actually touched base with them yet because they're not court-based. Mm -hmm. But in terms of the other style, other clinical trials um, as well as within court, they weren't really using the risk-based monitoring completely yet. So I don't know, I, to be honest, I'm not sure how these studies have um, their own interpretation of risk-based monitoring and how has it changed their clinical trial conduct. Because I know, and again, with this whole risk-based monitoring idea, I'm sure as we stand now that when a sponsor is developing a clinical trial, they look at the risk of the study anyway. They would look at the study population and they would look at the drug. So it's kind of it will be really interesting to get people's opinions. Do people feel they're already doing risk-based monitoring, but it's just not under that title? So um, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So I don't know if that answers the question, Siobhan. Yes. Yeah. No, 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 that's great. And I think I, I like your point there about um, you know their understandings of it and their interpretations of it. I think that yeah. that's really interesting. Um, so I don't think we've any more questions from uh, our, our online audience. Uh, so on that note, we might finish up. Um, what I will do is again, I will forward the recording to everybody this afternoon and it will be available on the website. Um, I just want to sincerely thank Caroline uh, for joining us today and delivering a very informative webinar. It's an excellent resource for the HRB TMRN to have. Um, and again, she has her email address there so people can contact her directly um, with some feedback. Just to uh, announce that our next webinar will be on October the 11th, and it is on factors affecting patient participation in clinical trials, and that is with Elaine Walsh, um, um, previously from the Irish Cancer Society, and we will also have a Q&A with Anne Sheridan from UCD, who was the co-author on the paper with Elaine. Uh, that's, again, there's been great interest in that webinar. Uh, so I hope to see you all again at that one. So I just, I close off the webinar now and just say a sincere thanks to everybody for joining in, and thanks again to you, Caroline. Thanks, and thanks everyone for your friends. Bye, Sandra, thank you. Thanks. Bye, bye, bye.